Yeah, so I'm going to talk today about armadillos. Some of you probably have seen me before, gave a presentation about bears, and this group was one of the best audiences I've ever had, ever. Um, and so uh, I'm always excited to come back. I know what last year I gave a talk on coyotes. This year, Pam and I decided we talk about armadillos because they are our new newest neighbors. Now, for clarification, you know, Pam mentioned I'm the fur bear biologist. If you're wondering what that fur bear is, it's typically defined as any mammal that was traditionally harvested for its fur. So anything from coyotes to raccoons to bobcats to river otters, beavers, muskrats, weasels, um, and skunks, including spotted skunks. There's about 17 species here in North Carolina, with armadillo being the newest one. And people always joke and say, well, armadillos don't have fur. So why does the fur bear biologist uh, you know, have armadillos in her program? And I tell them, partly, no one else wanted them. <laughs> I was the one that volunteered to start to monitor them and learn more about them in North Carolina. But two, they actually do have a little bit of fur uh, on their belly. And people do harvest this guy, as you will see, for various reasons. But people do harvest them and use their armored shell. So um, that's why I have them. But yeah, let's start. Um, this is just kind of an outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to talk about the major clad that they're in, which is their narthra, talk about their range expansion historically and into North Carolina, talk about how we are trying to learn more about the armadillos, primarily through observations that the public provides, some basics of their biology and behavior, because it's fairly unique. And then lastly, uh, talk about the impacts that armadillos have, both positive and negative. So with that, I'll start. Um, this is a good group. Um, I don't mind that if you have a question and you're worried you'll forget, go ahead and raise your hand. I think we can be pretty informal here. Um, but first, I wanted to talk about the major clad that armadillos are a part of, Xenarthra. This is a clad that pretty much comprises placenta mammals from the Americas. Um, and so the armadillo is in the same clad as sloths and anteaters. There's about 20 species of armadillos. Uh, but the only one that's in the United States is the nine-banded armadillo. The nine-banded armadillo is also the only species within the Xenarthra clad that has the largest range. You'll see from South America all the way to the United States. It's also the only species within Xenarthra that continues to have an expanding range. Um, so you'll see that the armadillo, the nine band armadillo has been very successful at adapting to our changing environment. So historically, the nine banded armadillo uh, was in the tropical forests of South America, especially Brazil. But we've seen over time that the armadillo has shown that it can be very adaptive to different habitats. So now we see armadillos can be in pine forests, they can be in deciduous forests, they can be in uh, grasslands, shrublands. We now also see them adapt to human development. They're perfectly fine being in lawns, golf courses, cemeteries. Again, very adaptable, and you'll see why. Part of it is as long as they can find their prey base, they can survive in that habitat. So sometime prior to the 1700s, they're guessing late 1600s, maybe early 1700s, we saw the armadillo expand into Central America and into Mexico. So that occurred uh, sometime, we think, in the 1700s. And then here in the US, we saw that by 1849, uh, armadillos had crossed the Rio Grande and were in Texas. And then we saw expansion after that. They got into Louisiana sometime around the 1930s. They got into Alabama and Georgia around the 1970s. They got into eastern Tennessee in the early 1980s. At the same time in Florida, in the 1920s, people actually purposely brought in and released armadillos. And so starting in Florida in the 1920s, we saw armadillos start to go northwards. I have tried to figure out why people released armadillos in Florida. I have not come up with the reason why. I, I still, to this day, I don't know why they did that, but they did. Um, so this is what the range of armadillos looked like by 2002. You know, you can see that they're in South Carolina, uh, Alabama, some of the Missouri, in other states, but again, not yet even close to North Carolina as of 2002. So let's skip to 2007, five years later. Uh, this is my first year working for the commission, 
and we received our first what I call credible observation of an armadillo from Macon County right here. And so right when that happened, we knew, okay, it's happening. Um, so we started discussing what we're going to do to start to monitor how they're expanding in. Because we have seen that it's really beneficial for us, not only with native species, to document where they occur in North Carolina, but especially non-native species. When coyotes first started to come in North Carolina, my predecessors started to monitor their expansion, and it really taught us a lot about how coyotes adapted to our environment um, and kind of the dynamics of a coyote population just by monitoring how they expanded into North Carolina. So we wanted to do the same for armadillos. So that was in 2007, it was a credible observation. And what I mean by that is we have three categories for observations. One is confirmed, then credible, and unconfirmed. Um, confirmed observation is where there's actual evidence of what the person saw. That could be photographic evidence or the carcass itself. Um, credible means, you know, they don't have evidence, they don't have a picture of the armadillo, they don't have the carcass, but maybe because of who they are, it's one of my fellow biologists who says they saw an armadillo, or someone reports a roadkill armadillo, no picture, but then I'm getting five other reports of an armadillo in the same location. Again, no pictures, but independent repeated observations in the same spot, that gives a credibility that that's probably an armadillo. And then our unconfirmed observations in which someone contacts me, says I saw an armadillo, and there's actually no evidence beyond what they're reporting to me. Um, and that's important because unconfirmed it could be something else. You know, armadillos, they appear very unique looking. They are unique looking. So you would think, how could you mistake the armadillo for anything but an armadillo? Well, snapping turtles. You know, this is a picture someone sent me. Um, you know, they sent me a video and a picture of the snapping turtle in the field, and they were calling it an armadillo. <laughs> and then possums, especially possums on ring videos. Um, you can see this possum, just kind of their body shape, the fact that they also have a tail that's hairless, um, pointy nose. When people see possums, they sometimes think they're armadillos. So I get a lot of possums, I get snapping turtles. In particular, um, people report roadkill armadillos, and if we can, if it's nearby where I am or one of my colleagues, we'll go out and check it out. And sometimes it turns out to be a, a snapping turtle that got hit by a car. Just a month ago, uh, I got a call from someone who, it was just south of Raleigh, just uh, south of where our office is on Lake Wheeler Road in Raleigh. And the woman reported a roadkill armadillo. And I'm like, holy crap, that's like two miles from our office. So I called my, the office and said, can someone go check it out? They went and checked it out, and it was a snapping turtle. So that's why we try to be careful with our categories. But with that, so this is our confirmed uh, observations in, by 2013. So again, North, you know, 2002, we had no armadillos. In fact, they weren't even in northern, the northern region of South Carolina. And here, in about 11 years later, we had three confirmed observations, Catawba, Cleveland, and Lincoln counties. And then you can see we had quite a few credible observations, mainly from Western North Carolina and a handful from Eastern North Carolina. Let's fast forward two years. We go from three counties with confirmed observations to 12. And again, now we're really seeing uh, where armadillos are becoming established is in Western North Carolina. And then this is our current map through 2022. They're confirmed in 28 of 100 counties of North Carolina. Um, and then we have interesting pockets where we've had a confirmed observation in Wake County, just one, and one in Dare County, which was from actually a game camera I had. So we know we're always behind where armadillos are. My range map is going to always be outdated. Uh, because again, if they're here, of course they had to get there somehow. <laughs> it's just I haven't got the confirmation that they exist. Now, a lot of folks were surprised when they see this map that this is where armadillos are seen the most. You know, they would expect it in the southeastern North Carolina. But I tell them, well, the reason why is 
This area of North Carolina is adjacent to four states that have established populations, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. Whereas down here is just South Carolina, and even in South Carolina, that armadillo population is still becoming established. So yeah, this is why we see them in West North Carolina, is because of those other four states. And so those other four states are now sourcing armadillos to our region. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that, this is, you know, those are confirmed observations. What I'm also trying to track is where armadillos are becoming established. And how I do that is getting evidence of multiple armadillos seen in one observation. So usually that means that someone's probably going to see four armadillos because that's how many young are produced by female armadillos. As you'll see, it's four identical quadruplets. And so when these quadruplets leave mom and go out on their own, they initially travel together. And so if I get a report as in these, you know, here's the video of someone taking a picture of four, a video of four, and then a picture of four, Obviously, well, that means reproduction's occurring, so the population is established. That, that's how we would determine establishment of any walleye population is evidence of reproduction. So these are my six western counties that have an established population. Um, I, I was just telling uh, someone earlier, they're probably established in Buncombe County uh, because I've received, what, at least over 80 observations of armadillos in Buncombe County. I just haven't received yet a confirmed observation of multiple armadillos, but I'm sure they're established, just haven't gotten the evidence. Can I interrupt the question? Yeah. Um, they, are they pretty tolerant of people? Very tolerant to people. So they could get those photographs. Above. Yeah, so, so yeah, armadillos have really poor vision. Great sense of smell, but poor vision. So I've had people take videos where, I mean, they're right over that armadillo. And as long, you know, as, as long as they're somewhat quiet, armadillo has no clue they're there. So yeah. And yeah, you can get close. It's not dangerous for you or the armadillo. Yeah. Yeah. So overall, this is where we've received all reports. Um, and you can see, again, not surprisingly, where we're seeing establishment of the population, where also that's where we get the most reports from, is Western North Carolina. But we still have about a handful of county, what is that like? 22 or 25, um, I can't, 26 counties in which I haven't received any observations yet. Now, every year we try to promote that we are interested in observation, especially from more now the west, the eastern fringe of the mountains and the foothills and into the Piedmont and coastal plain. Um, and we tell the public they have two ways of doing it. I don't know how many of you guys have the iNaturalist app on your phone, but that's one easy way. You know, you see an armadillo, you click a picture, and you load it up in iNaturalist. We have a NC Armadillo project on iNaturalist. The other way is just simple email, armadillo at ncwalak.org. And what I tell people is, even if you weren't able to get a picture, because sometimes, especially if it's a roadkill armadillo, it'd be unsafe to try to get a picture because of traffic. But even if you don't get a picture, just tell me what you have. Um, because again, sometimes no picture, but repeated independent observations in the same spot lends credibility and confirmation that what you saw was an armadillo. So those are the two ways we collect observations. And I'll say this, uh, I get almost daily now, I get reports from the public. Um, this is by year. I started collecting observations in 2007. As of 2022, we went from one observation to 234 in 2022 alone. Um, this year, I'm, I know I'm going to break that record because, again, I, I get observations daily, especially after the weekend when people have been out and about. I'll usually come back to my uh, inbox and have 10 to 15 emails of armadillo observations. So armadillos, it's definitely reflecting the increasing population as well as the increasing interest by the public. The time of year we get observations is summertime. Um, it's when people are more likely outdoors. It's also when armadillos are more active during the daytime. You know, armadillos, they have that armor, as you'll see more pictures of, but it doesn't provide much insulation. So what we see is in the wintertime, they'll be more active during the day. In the summertime, they might be active more at night. But year-round, they can be active during the day. If it's sunny and a nice day, they'll be, they can be active during the day easily. And so we tend to get most of our observations in the summertime. Um, and then it starts to go down in September into October. But still, if it's a nice sunny day in the wintertime, 
I'll get those observations. I, I usually can count on that, especially up here in the mountains, if it's been kind of like sunny and it gets into the 50s or 60s, I'll get armadillo reports because the armadillos come out and become active during the daytime. So I want to talk about you know, some interesting things about the armadillo. It is the only mammal that instead of fur, it has armor. Um, and that's why it's named the armadillo. Um, the nine-banded armadillo is, um, is named after the Spanish word for little armored one. And in particular, the nine-banded armadillo was called because it does have bands, these plates, that actually can move like an accordion. Um, doesn't always have nine. Basically, these nine-banded armadillos can have seven to 11 in the midsection. So again, not all nine-banded armadillos have nine bands. It does vary. But you can see this incredible shell that they have. Again, the only mammal that has that. They have deer-like ears and then that long pig snout. And it's that snout that gives them another nickname, uh, armored pig, yeah. So was the armor made up? Was it bone or cartilage? It's bone, yeah. Bone. It is bone, yep. Um, and it, 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 if it's pretty easy to preserve. The problem is, you know, unfortunately, one of the main causes of death for armadillos is a vehicle collision. So it's usually pretty shattered. Um, so yeah, it's called an armored pig. I'm going to show some other nicknames because of all the species I get to work with, this is an animal that has the most nicknames. Just, I think partly just people are just so fascinated by them because they are so different than our other mammal species. So here are some other nicknames. Uh, they're known as poor men's pork, the Hoover hog, Texas turkey, possum on the half shell. <laughs> and you'll see some of the commonalities are, it relates to food. Um, in South America, People always ate armadillos. They still eat armadillos. Um, in some areas, it's a, it's a staple. We saw here, um, as they populated in the United States, um, especially in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, um, people started to eat armadillos because, well, it was during the Depression. You know, so times were tough. And we saw an increase in consumption of armadillos. Thus, the Hoover hog, because of course, President Hoover was uh, the president during the Depression, poor man's pork. Um, and the reason it's hog, pork, pig, partly is because those that have eaten armadillos say it kind of tastes similar to pork. It tastes like pork, the texture is similar to pork. I haven't tried armadillo meat, but it's on my bucket list. I, <laughs> I really want to try it. Um, and people do eat it. And this is actually a website that sells exotic meats including armadillos. So for the low price of over $300, you can buy armadillo meat and give it a try. Um, but yeah, so these are all the names. And again, I've, I've heard good things about it. So let's talk about reproduction. Um, you know, armadillos are unique. Again, they have that armored shell that makes them pretty unique. Their reproduction is, is also very unique. One, they become mature at one years old, and they tend to breed in July and August. They have something called delayed implantation, which is a reproductive strategy we also see in black bears, grizzly bears, river otters, fishers, in which you know that zygote doesn't implant. There's delayed implantation uh, for about four months in the case of the armadillo. The reason we see delayed implantation in certain mammal species, including the armadillo, is it better assures that the young are born during a time of year that's favorable, basically springtime, when weather is more mild. So they'll breed June and August. They have delayed implantation for about four months. After that four months, they start gestation. And it's during the gestation, which is also four months, that that zygote implants um, and splits into four identical embryos. And then we see in spring, March, and April, they'll give birth to four identical quadruplets. I at least I know there's I'm not aware of any mammal species in North America that does that reproductive strategy and has quadruplets. Again, going back to. That's why I use uh, confirmation of multiple armadillos, because if you see four armadillos, those are siblings um, that have left mom. So once they're born, they're, oh, go ahead. So is the uh, number four pretty predictable, I think? It's very predictable, yes. Do you ever get twos or 
Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, I think the only reason you might get an odd number is maybe if one of the embryos, for some reason, doesn't make it, it might get reabsorbed into the uterine wall. I see that with black bears quite a bit. Um, some of the early research I did on black bears showed that a bear might have reabsorbent embryo or it's born, but it doesn't make it. Um, but typically it's four. Um, and to be honest, when I get pictures of multiple armadillos, I've yet to get a picture of three <laughs> or two. So survivorship so far seems pretty good for these young guys. And we see when they're born, they're precocial, their eyes are open, they can walk within hours. Um, they are born in a burrow. They usually leave the burrow um, or the nest within three weeks. They usually get weaned about three to five months, they're weaned, and then in six months to a year, they'll leave mom. Yeah. So are, are you gonna show us a picture of the birthing burrow? Yes, yes, yes. I don't have a picture inside of one, but you'll see what, what one on the outside looks like to look for, yep. So their diet, this is one reason they've been so successful, um, is because their main diet is invertebrates which so far is not in short supply. Um, and their teeth have adapted to that diet. They have peg-like teeth. You can see a better picture here. Really good at mashing and grinding those invertebrates, especially some of the invertebrates maybe with the hardest shell. But they'll eat beetles, grubs, ants, termites, worms. I tell people that's one benefit of armadillos is they love fire ant mounds. So yeah. <laughs> now can they eat enough to actually control them? I haven't seen that in the southeast, but at least something's eating the fire ants. Um, they will sometimes eat fruit, sometimes they'll eat amphibians. I know some of our biologists that work with salamanders have concerns about if armadillos are going to impact some of those sensitive populations. Probably not, um, just because again, their main diet is invertebrates. They will on occasion eat bird eggs as well, um, ground nesting birds. So I know there's been concerns um, if they're gonna have impact like on quail or turkey. Um, but I know the other states that have had established population for years haven't really tied in that armadillos are impacting some of those sensitive bird species. I think again, they just aren't preying on eggs that much to have an impact. Again, they're focused on the invertebrates that they find in the ground. And so to get those invertebrates, um, they forage for them. They forage for them mainly using that nose I talked about, that pig-like nose. I already mentioned vision's poor, but their sense of smell is incredible. So what they do is they pretty much shuffle through their woods, as you can see there. They shuffle through and they just use their nose to kind of pick up and kick through the leaf litter. If they sense that there's a prey base, if they sense those invertebrates, they'll dig into the ground. Now you'll see later, that's one of the negative impacts armadillos can have is because of that digging. You know, um, they'll create damage. And if you're a golf course or a cemetery, that's not a good thing to have that digging activity because it causes quite a bit of damage. Here's the burrows. So they do, they build these burrows. Um, they can have up to 10 in their home range. The entrance of the burrow is usually about eight to 12 inches. Um, it can be, it's usually about a few feet in length, but I know they've documented one burrow that was at least 12 feet long, so pretty deep. And the two main reasons they create these burrows is for shelter, especially if it's a really cold day. Um, again, they lack that insulation because of that armor, so they go into their burrow um, to protect themselves from the cold weather, as well as that's where they have their young. And again, their young usually can leave the burrow and start walking around outside about three weeks after being born. Now, one thing that some researchers are starting to look more into is whether armadillos could be considered an ecosystem engineer. You know, we call beavers eco ecosystem engineers because of the habitat they create for a suite of wildlife. Um, we see that also with gopher tortoises and the burrows that gopher tortoises create can provide a suite, can provide a hab habitat for a suite of species. The researchers are learning that maybe armadillos do the same thing. Um, there's a researcher who they put out a bunch of game cameras in Arkansas at armadillo burrows to document what other wildlife uses these burrows and found that, if I can remember, they found that there are 40 different species of birds, uh, 19 species of mammals, 
uh, four different species of amphibians, one reptile species, and then a lot of like insects and vertebrates that are, and small animals that, that were using these burrows as well. And what they learned is some of these species were predators and they were attracted to these burrows for the prey base that was attracted to it, be it small mammals or insects. They found that it served as a refugia from predators. So animals that were preyed upon would find refuge in the burrow against the predator or find refugia from just weather. If it was snowy or windy or raining, animals would use these burrows for protection. Or thermal refugia, where they're using these burrows either because it's really cold outside or really hot. Again, pretty temperature controlled deep into that burrow. Also, they saw use just for resting and sleeping. In some cases, the burrows were repurposed as a den, and that's where some species, specifically mammals, such as foxes, would have their young. So that was the first study documenting that, and there's definitely a need to do more research. But yeah, we're seeing that these burrows serve as biodiversity hotspots, which is a very positive thing. So let's see, oh, oh shoot, let me try to get, because that's a cool video. There we go. <laughs> so it used to be thought that, let me see if it, hopefully it'll do repeat, we'll see. So um, um, it used to be thought that water was a barrier for armadillo movements. Well, of course, when armadillo has gone into Texas, it proved that wrong. Then they crossed the Mississippi River, so that was wrong. I'll do it again just in case you didn't see it. So armadillos, yeah, water's not a barrier. Boop. As you can see, that little guy can swim. I, I got this from my colleague in Arkansas. He's a fur bear biologist like me in Arkansas. He, he uh, was able to get that video. And they found, yeah, armadillos can swim. They can even, depending on how fast or slow the current is, they can actually walk along the bottom of the water. Um, if they do swim, one unique feature they have is they actually are able to fill their stomach and intestines with air which provides buoyancy. Yeah, just again, there's a lot of unique things about this animal. Um, oh, there, there he goes again. I know, I love that video. Um, they have a lot of defensives, um, defense against predators. So one is they're just fast runners. If they get alarmed, um, they will run fast. I was at a meeting of other fur bear biologists in South Carolina and the area we were in had a ton of armadillos. And so we would kind of go out at night and spotlight for armadillos. I tried to chase several armadillos and never came close to catching one. Um, they're just so good. You can see this dog just scurrying away. They kind of can do an er move fast and erratic pattern that can make it hard to get. So that's one of their first defenses. If they sense that there's a threat, they just run off. The hard carapace can also serve some degree of protection. Um, depending on how the predator goes after them, it can be hard for that animal to get a grip on the animal. But sometimes predators, if they get just the right spot, they can break through that hard carapace. But it does serve as some level of protection. I will say young armadillos are pretty susceptible to predation because when they're born, even though they're precocial, their eyes are open, they can walk within a few days. There's that bony plate is still not hardened. Um, it takes some time to harden, so it's pretty soft their first few months of being born, making them a bit more vulnerable. The other thing they'll do is, if a predator's chasing them, they will sometimes run off, but then they'll dig a trench or a quick burrow and just go in. And you know they have powerful claws, you know, because they need that for digging, and they'll just dig in and hold and you pretty much cannot pull that armadillo out. So that's the other defensive mechanism they have to avoid predation. Um, they expel an anal spray uh, that is very foul smelling. Um, and so again, just like skunks, you know, that can be something to dissuade a predator from wanting to continue to go after them. And then they have this tendency to jump when they're alarmed or frightened, as you can see in this picture. Um, the problem with that is, Maybe it served a useful function, you know, before there were cars and roads. But now what we see is that that response makes them pretty vulnerable to collisions with cars. That's why we see so many on the roads is because, you know, a car, you know, they're in the road, a car's coming up, they get alarmed, 
and guess what? They're pretty much jumping right in front of the car's bumper. Um, you know, whereas maybe if they didn't jump, the car might go over them. Now they're right there. So it makes them really vulnerable to mortality. And up until last year, 2022, the majority of the reports I got about armadillos in North Carolina were vehicle collisions. Um, you know, definitely the number of observations of dead armadillos outnumbered the reports of live armadillos. But that changed. So starting in 2022, it flipped. Now I see that 52% of my observations are of live armadillos. Um, kind of indicating though, again, the success of the population, how much it's expanding, how much it's becoming established, um, versus 46% of armadillos are still of uh, dead armadillos. Primary cause, again, is roadkill mortality. Though on occasion, I know we had one armadillo that was reported that a dog had killed. Um, and then I get a handful of armadillo observations from the mountains in which like a mountain biker or a hiker comes across just a dead armadillo and will take a picture and they're like, what caused this? And usually I'll, I'll look at what the weather was like or the temperatures and I could tell the, the uh, animal, the armadillo died from exposure to cold conditions. Again, that armored layer uh, protects them to some degree from predators but it's not very well insulated. So they are vulnerable to sustained cold weather. You know, if it's below freezing for a certain number of days, they start to become vulnerable to dying of, of hypothermia. They can climb. Now we've never documented that they can climb trees, but certainly fences. Again, those claws can grab it. So when people have issues with armadillos, we do encourage making barriers, but we also caution that if it's a traditional chain link fence, the armadillo might be able to penetrate that barrier because they can climb it. And this is what armadillo damage typically looks like. Uh, this is a burrow. Um, their burrows, again, I already mentioned, can be very valuable to other wildlife. But depending on where that burrow is, it can damage your trees. Um, it can even cause the tree to die because it impacts the root system. Uh, this is a golf course that was in Cashers in which the golf course was experiencing extensive armadillo damage. You can usually tell because they'll dig holes. The holes are usually about three to five inches wide and go about three inches deep. It almost looks like a funnel. Um, and so what they'll do is they'll dig for the grubs, and as they dig, they pull up the grass and flip it over. Um, so yeah, if you are a cemetery or a golf course, you're not happy with the damage that's being caused. So that is a negative impact that we see. Um, managing armadillo damage can be very challenging. Um, they're, the only non-lethal tool right now is just creating barriers. You know, you know, tox, you know, one, of course, you can't poison. Poisoning is illegal here in North Carolina, thankfully, because of the impacts on non-target species. But two, we're not aware of any like toxicants or repellents that are effective on armadillos. Um, so really, it's just creating a barrier that if an armadillo is getting into your garden or getting into an area of your yard you don't want them to get into, it's trying to create a barrier, maybe a small wooden fence. Um, but otherwise, if you're experiencing armadillo damage, uh, the other alternative is lethal means. But even then, that's challenging. Um, we do have a regulated trapping season in which it includes the take of armadillos if you have a trapping license. The thing with armadillos is their prey base is invertebrates. Um, it makes it really hard to bait them into a trap. There really is no bait that you can use to put in a, a box trap to catch an armadillo. Um, what I advise people that do want to trap an armadillo is figure out where they're moving on the landscape. They like to go along like the edges of houses or any other kind of edge, they'll follow the edge. And so I had one homeowner that said he was having armadillo damage and wanted to try trapping. I said, set the trap along the side of your house. Sure enough, he caught the armadillo. It's really putting the, the, box, the cage trap in the path of movement. I know other people, they'll find out where the burrow is and they'll put the cage trap at the entrance of the burrow and they're successful. Baiting won't work. However, there's a company that produces this wooden trap um, and they sell it for $300. So it's <laughs> actually $359. It's pretty expensive. But they, they advertise it's effective, and there is some evidence they're right, because it's scented with armadillo. So it's caught an armadillo, 
uh, somehow they're catching armadillos in these traps and then once the armadillo is caught, its scent is maintained in the wood and there's some evidence that armadillos are attracted to the scent of other armadillos. So they sell these. Um, I've never used it, but there does seem to be some evidence that it works. Uh, the other option people have is we have a year-round hunting season. It is a non-native species. We don't want to create barriers to people being able to address conflicts they're having. Um, but again, you know, a lot of people live in an area where it's against the law to discharge a firearm to do city or town ordinance, as well as the fact that, you know, you just have to have the opportunity. You know, there's a reason why armadillos have expanded so much. Um, their populations are pretty much almost impossible to manage, you know, uh, and they re reproduce, as you saw, at a pretty high rate. They reproduce every year and have four young, and the young have high survivorship. So their populations are very robust. So we don't expect to be able to manage armadillo populations. We're more focused on if you're having damage, what can we do to work with you to help resolve that damage, whether it's non-lethal or lethal. Someone was looking, you know, was hoping I'd have this slide, and I do. The other negative thing that armadillos are associated with is leprosy. Um, you know, leprosy is an old world disease. I think the first documentation of leprosy was in 4000 BC. If it's referenced in the Bible, it has a lot of negative connotations. It was brought to the Americas, I think, around 500 years ago, um, initially into South America. And for years, there really was no treatment um, for leprosy. Um, if you got it, um, there was really nothing they could do to help you out. That You definitely could not be cured of it. Um, well, in the 1960s, there was a researcher, Eleanor Storms, that discovered that besides humans, armadillos were the only other mammal species susceptible to leprosy. And the reason why is leprosy, the bacteria that causes it, thrives in lower temperatures. An armadillo's body temperature is about 88 degrees, 87 to 89, so lower than even a human's temperature. And they found that the bacteria that causes leprosy thrives in armadillos. They really multiply, they really go deep into the tissue and muscles. And so Eleanor discovered that nine-banded armadillos would be great species to conduct leprosy research. And that's what she ended up doing. And so once they did that, they could multiply the bacteria at large sums. They could do experiments to identify possible vaccines or treatments that were effective with uh, leprosy. It is a bacteria. So they started to try to identify an antibiotic that was effective in treating and killing that bacteria. Um, the other thing that made armadillos ideal for doing this research besides their lower body temperature is again those identical quadruplets I talked about. So they have their four young and they're identical. So they could do these controlled experiments um, because of the identical quadruplets. So it really expanded the research. Um, they basically within you know a few decades came up with a therapy that involves an antibiotic and it used to be, you know, millions of people would be infected and have to deal with leprosy. Um, this graph, and this is a, a great website I got this information on, because I'm not a leprosy expert. So, <laughs> uh, so I go to the experts that are, that, you know, there used to be millions of people infected every year. And then in, as of at least 2012, they only had 190,000 cases worldwide. Again, they went from millions of cases a year to 190,000. Now, we are seeing a bacterial strain that causes leprosy that's unique to the United States. They've documented it in Florida. Um, I think, I'm trying to think if they, I think they have documented it in a couple other states. So it's definitely an evolved strain from the one that was introduced to South America 500 years ago. Uh, but again, it's fairly uncommon. And research done on armadillos in the US, they find armadillos infected with leprosy anywhere from zero to 10%. So the maximum they have found um, in any armadillo population is 10%. So still pretty uncommon. The good news, it's really easy to avoid getting leprosy from armadillos. You know, a lot of people, they associate armadillos with leprosy, they think, oh, it's a bad thing. The only, you know, the way that you get leprosy, the primary way, is getting exposed to you know, feces from the armadillo. So if you're working out in your garden, 
or working outside and you're working in an area where, yeah, there's established armadillos, wear gloves. Um, I wear, you know, I encourage the public to wear gloves whenever they're working outdoors, not only just to protect your hand from scratches and other things that happen when you're working outside, but there's a whole host of parasites and diseases that can be in your soil, not just from armadillos, more likely, you know, toxoplasmosis that's left behind by, you know, outdoor cats that are defecating in your garden. I had a friend of mine who got toxoplasmosis and they figured out she had been working in her garden without gloves and that's how she got exposed. So, you know, there's a whole host of potential diseases and, and parasites that can be in your soil. So yeah, always wear gloves. If you see an armadillo that's dead on the road and you want to touch it, wear gloves. <laughs> Please wear gloves when handling wildlife, dead or alive. Um, I know that they've documented some people getting leprosy from consuming armadillo meat. That's just like every other meat, it's undercooked. Um, if you cook it to temperature, that'll kill the bacteria that makes the meat safe for consumption. So this is my last slide. Um, yeah, how far will armadillos go? Um, I was reading a research report from 2013 that didn't think armadillos would even be able to become established in North Carolina. And uh, it made me laugh. Uh, they, they really underestimated what this guy could do. Um, certainly there's barriers for movement. One is dry conditions. Um, again, their prey base is mainly invertebrates. And so that prey base gets impacted if the soil conditions are really dry. So that can happen. Again, they're susceptible to cold, but they can survive for a few days. If temperatures drop below freezing, they can survive for a few days because guess what? They go into burrows or they go into crawl spaces. I'm getting more reports in the winter time of people discovering armadillos in their crawl spaces or underneath their decks that are enclosed. Um, they can be susceptible to starvation in winter because if it's cold enough and the soil is frozen, it makes it really hard for them to dig into the soil for their prey base. But we're seeing fewer and fewer long stretches of below freezing conditions in North Carolina. Yeah, it gets on below 32 degrees, but maybe only for a few days. It has to be sustained for weeks for that to really start to impact armadillos. And we're just not seeing that anymore. I know my colleague in Virginia, my counterpart in Virginia, they are having confirmed observations in Virginia as well. So we're not quite sure how far north armadillos will make it, but probably much further north than what academics previously thought. So we shall see, but I imagine armadillos are gonna become established statewide in North Carolina easily within the next 10 years, if not five years. So they are here to stay. I'm learning just as much about them as the general public, because again, they're still relatively new. What impacts they'll have on our ecosystem, I do not know, but they're here to stay, and we're gonna have to learn to coexist with them.